Um, anyways, this is um, running a music publication sort of session hosted by Modern Music Analysis. And with me, I have my team of writers and editors and Kevin Alexander of the Riff Publication on Medium. Uh, I'd like to start with some in introductions. Um, I'll go first. My name is Josh Herring, recent graduate of Auburn University. Owner, editor in chief, whatever you'd like to say about uh, of modern music analysis. Sorry, I'm a writer, freelance writer, author, I'm working on a debut novel right now that's dropping in a couple of months. And uh, I mean, yeah, that's the that's the breadth of me. Um, whoever next, whoever like to go for. Uh, I'll go. Um, for those of you that don't know me, I'm Kevin Alexander. I run The Riff on Medium, and I also have a Substack newsletter called On Repeat. Um, I've been on Medium for, I think, almost three years now, maybe. Uh, kind of came in in the middle of the pandemic, like so many other people did, um, and then wound up um, first joining The Riff as a writer, um, and then kind of almost overrunning the owner, Noah Levy, at the time with submissions. Um, and then it was kind enough to say, hey, why don't you join us as an editor? So I did. And then um, one thing led to another. He's off in Europe working. Um, another editor, Rob Janicki, who is a name most of you know, uh, is off writing a book right now, uh, which should be out later this year. And so um, it's more or less just me at the wheel right now. Um, but that, yeah. I'll go next. Uh, my name's Paul. I am a writer for Modern Music Analysis as well, and I became an editor for Modern Music Analysis this year. I'm also an editor and a writer for another music publication called The Renaissance Project, and I've also written a few articles for The Riff, and yeah, I'm just glad to be on this panel, and I hope I can learn and share information with all of you about running a music publication. I guess I'll go next. Um, hey, everyone. My name is Mark. I'm a writer and editor for Modern Music Analysis. Uh, during the day, I'm a video editor and social media specialist. And in between that, I like to consider myself a music critic, not like Anthony Fantano, but maybe hopefully one day. Um, <laughs> Glad to have everyone here and hope to learn from a lot of you guys. Yeah, so I am also in staff for music analysis. Um, yeah, so just excited to be here and yeah. Yeah, I'm Robin and I wrote I mainly write um, articles for Modern Music Analysis, but I also wrote one article for The Riff. Um, and I'm working on something for, for the movie After Sun. I'm, I'm the soundtrack of the movie After Sun, so maybe. But um, currently I'm writing um, on my thesis, so I don't have that much time, unfortunately. All right, thank you guys. Um, it's actually nice to see your faces. Robin and Cassidy is actually the first time I've seen your faces and spoken to you directly uh, since you guys have joined recently. Kevin, nice to meet you as well. Um, so we'll, we'll move on sort of to, to the, the larger point of the session is sort of to lift the veil between the reader and uh, the readers of Medium and what music publications are. And we sort of want to give the, the audience uh, what goes on behind the scenes of running a music publication. And I'll start by saying sort of the background of what modern music analysis is. So like Kevin was saying, I, I like a lot of people joined medium in like 2020 ish, uh, not too far removed from the pandemic, really in the height of it. Mm -hmm. And I was sort of looking for, for uh, an outlet of, for my creative endeavors sort of, because that's really when I first started writing uh, poetry and music reviews. I remember my very first music review. And that's sort of where modern music analysis came from was one day down and wrote a full like analysis of the weekend discography. And that was the very first music music. And on the other hand, 
the the very central idea of what modern music now, modern music analysis was was originally called rhyme and reason and this page is still out there somewhere i don't even know if i have access to it but um i, I don't think i've ever told anyone that before i opened up modern, modern music analysis was it was called rhyme and reason before and then i just scrapped the entire idea because i thought it was cheesy anyways <laughs> um but yeah like um around i mean mark you 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 can speak to this that you were one of the very first writers that I that I reached out to and had on modern music analysis and I remember pretty much the exact moment it was sort of like an epiphany moment like I saw your essay it was an essay on Tabimpa butterfly and to this day if you type in um, Tabimpa butterfly analysis that's the first thing that pops up on Google and it still remains the publication's most popular piece to this day. And I'm glad, like, I just took the moment because back then you couldn't, like, really, like, speak directly to people on Medium. You could just add notes. And I added notes. I was like, hey, you want to come write for me? And it, it sort of snowballed from there. Like, I, I when you said yes, I guess I sort of just gained the gained the confidence to sort of keep going and keep adding writers. And we've added more. We've lost a lot more than we've added. But admittedly like i'm glad to see you guys here and continue writing for me and mark I'd, I'd love to see your perspective as a writer um being my first writer and sort of what it went to end your decision to write for mma and what what attracts you to this day to still write for me it's like this was almost over two years ago i think that i first invited you yeah definitely so um well, technically i've been writing since like i want to say 2018 at one point in time i did have like my own website but uh, during my undergrad, I got really busy with film school and all that, so I gave up on it. Then um, around 2020, like most people during the height of the pandemic, I joined Medium um, and I was writing some album reviews here and there throughout the year, just sparsely so I can keep, and I, like, keep myself busy during the quarantine. And uh, it was around, I think, January 2021, I ended up finding the Kendrick Lamar analysis that you mentioned. It was somewhere in my Google Docs somewhere. So I'm like, you know what? I'll publish it on Medium. I'll like rewrite it, rework it, retool it. And I'll just see, because I like what I wrote, and I figured, hey, someone else, someone else might like it too. Um, fast forward maybe like that same week, and it's getting a ton of traction, which really kind of scared me, to be honest, because I was like, oh, wow, oh, there's a lot of people here. And um, from there, I saw your note about joining MMA. And at the time, I saw Medium as like just a website you can post your writing and just be about your day. I didn't really see it as a community. And it wasn't until that I joined MMA and realized, no, there's a, definitely a social aspect to Medium, which is something I enjoy and is why I keep writing for Medium as well. Um, in the early days of MMA, kind of like how I, was, how I started writing in 2020, like here and there I was posting articles, kind of really covering a lot of artists that I like to listen to, mostly like hip hop and R&B. And then I think that same year is when you brought me in as an editor. And I feel like at that same time, you we were also trying, starting to recruit more writers as well. So being able to actually read and see other people's opinions, other people's takes on different genres um, was really inspiring for me as well. Yeah, definitely. That was that was one of the, the trademarks that I, I, I was sort of going for when I made the publication was that I didn't want it to be like a, a solo project for me. I wanted it to be a place because at the time, Medium, I think the riff was probably one of the only other active music publications on medium at the time this is a couple of years ago and now there's there's at least a few more now so i was like let me let me brainstorm a way to where this isn't the only the only place where people can go and drop their music related takes right and and kevin i'm, I'm gonna sort of move to you here and like so one of the main differences between between the riff and the modern music analysis is both almost age sort of and in particularly the audience I would, i'd like to hear your take on sort of what the origins of the riff were you spoke on it a little bit um, in your intro i just want to get a little bit more on what the riff is to you and what it is in medium so sure so i think i think the quick answer is that the riff audience skews a little older like it's more gen x whereas mma is a little bit younger i think um I don't think there's a huge gap between. Um, 
and I don't, and I think I see them as um, complementary, not com- com- competitive. Um, I see Rui Alves in the chat as well. He's got rock and heavy um, that has almost an, I mean, they're all music, but almost an entirely different demographic. Um, Buddy God has plethora of pop. Um, I'm sure as soon as I stop talking, I'll think of like two or three more. Um, but medium is a big tent and there's a space for all of those, I think. Um, and there's something for everybody, you know, music is pretty universal, but there's a lot of common ground between each, you know, Paul, you've written stuff for both, uh, Josh, you have as well. Um, I've written for, you know, rock and heavy and plethora of pop too. Um, so I, I guess the easy answer is that, um, age is or, or demographic is a little bit of a difference and also i think ours is a little bit wider of scope um yours is more like strictly record reviews not strictly but it focuses more on record reviews uh where ours is a little more broad i think ours touches more on um experience experiential things or maybe not quite memoir but close to it if that makes sense um but I don't, I don't see them as um, a competition so much as I see the four or five or six publications sort of heading up the music segment of Medium itself, if that makes sense. Maybe. Yeah, that, that absolutely makes sense. I, I really I enjoy seeing sort of even the followers of each one sort of interact with all of each other. I know that's how I sort of found Paul. Um, when he began as an, uh, a writer for me, I saw him in, what was it? It was probably the Renaissance era um, or Renaissance project. Sorry, Paul. Um, and we, we sort of all conglomerate into this one, this one medium ironically enough um and it's just fun to see all the sort of different uh aspects of, of each that that each publication provides if that, that makes sense and i've sort of i and you talked about the audience difference which is very true we do cater to a i would say a younger one i really like because we cover a lot of contemporary stuff which is pretty much the point in the modern music analysis we cover everything after the year 2000 and that eliminates the a larger history of music and i, I sort of don't want to talk about what, what your motivation is as a publication as opposed to your audience like our motivation is covering contemporary music for the younger audience um sort of rebel how we feel and how we reckon with music as people under largely 25 how would it, how would an older audience do that in the same way be- be- before that i i just want to add a little point um because of this competition thing you know, because this is something I, I think is very important. Um, we should learn from each other instead of competing. I, I don't believe in this um, yeah, kind of ideology that we have to um, split apart and compete against each other to um, achieve greater goals or something. Um, the same in university. I don't believe in that. I, I think um, human thought is always valuable and it should be valued. It's just I just wanted to add this because I think it's important. Yeah, hundred percent. I think I think everybody here would agree with that. And um, just to be clear, I, I think you know again, there's room for each of these publications. I think we, as a segment or genre, are competing against the rest of medium together. I don't, um, but I don't see any kind of um, competition or infighting at all between any of the. Um, music publications. In fact, I think it's far more collaborative than some of the other genres or segments might be, um, at least on the surface. Um, To answer your question, um, why do I run this publication? Um, You guys focus more on post 2000, um, sort of by default, because I have an older demographic. There's a lot more, you know, look backs or essays. Um, I, I think everybody has a story to tell. Um, and frankly, the world needs more storytellers. We don't need, you know, um, boilerplate AI generated, you know, content from a content mill. We need, um, everyone's a story. Everyone has a story. Um, and I think it's my job to sort of tease it out of them. And if I can help someone get their story out into the world, then, um, then I've done my job correctly, I think. So, 
that's kind of what keeps me going. Um, you know, the truth is some, some people are just extremely talented too. And um, it's kind of, you know, a perk of the job to get to see their stuff first. Um, but everybody, you know, without exception has an interesting story and one of value. And I think um, if I, like I said, if I can help get that in front of more eyes or, you know, help get their idea, help get their idea across to a reader, then, then I've done my job. I honestly couldn't have put it any better. That's one of my my driving motives as a writer is to spread beauty and spread a message because all art is a message. All all music and all things of that nature, all writings are forms of art. And sort of being able to spread that, have the, the platform, one, and being able to spread the message is so important to me. And I'm going to sort of sort of trend in the opposite direction here and uh, I'll talk a little bit about it after you you answer, but what are some of like the biggest um, challenges that you face uh, while running the rift? So, um, time, of course, um, is always trouble. Uh, the other thing, um, and I heard it phrased really well on an earlier panel. Um, you know, not everything is ready for prime time, and sometimes you have to tell someone, "Sorry, this isn't this isn't going to work." Um, and uh, an editor named Deb Harmon referred to it as a quote unquote courteous no. Um, I hate telling anyone no um, because, you know, when you write something, you're making yourself kind of vulnerable a little bit and you're putting your work out there. And to have someone reject it uh, sucks. And I don't like being the one to reject it. But at the same time, I think I would be doing a writer a disservice if I just let it rip. So I try and, you know, let them down easy, explain. You know, hey, this isn't going to work. Here's why. Here's what might happen. Or, you know, here's what you can do to fix it or, um, you know, work on for next time. Or maybe, you know, maybe it was something as easy as uh, something as simple as, you know, this was the fifth story on, you know, Robbie Robertson or whatever today. I got to wait a little bit. Um, so, you know, letting people down easy is always a challenge. I, I don't like doing it. Um, trying to manage the time. Um, you know, we pivoted a little bit and we can talk about it more. Um, we can boost stories at the riff. Um, and so we basically pivoted, like my goal or our North star is to basically get you nominated if we can, however that takes. Um, and so we kind of reformatted things like we don't do tag bombs. We limited CTAs. Um, there was some heartburn with that, which was kind of a challenge because, I don't know that I did the best I best job of messaging that, like letting people know why we were doing what we were doing. Um, so those are all things. Um, but all in all, you know, it's it's not I'm not running um, the writing cooperative or the startup. I don't have, you know, 400 writers, so I'm not too mode under. So mainly time management and just letting people down easy. I think those are the biggest hurdles. I think your I think your latter point is probably one of the the most common things in especially liberal and creative arts is that failure is probably one of the most important parts of being um, a creative. Like if you don't fail, you're probably not a very good creative, in my opinion, because failure is such a vital part of who I am today. Um, and if you don't have that, I mean, we we do hold the power, unfortunately, to do that but at times it's necessary i've had to reject my fair share of things my fair share of writers and it's not necessarily a an an admonishment to those writers and their pieces it's just there are one thing we have to recognize as writers there's always someone or something better at the very thing we try to do and the best we can hope to do is sort of emulate those people and those styles of writings and to elevate ourselves as writers and, and incorporate those those failures and sort of just latch on to su- to eventually succeed, if that makes sense. Um, Paul, uh, um, I believe I believe um, my editors and writers have a couple questions for you, Kevin. If you don't mind answering, sure. So I'll go first, and I feel like this could be um, a loaded question for any writer. But how do you decide specifically what you're going to write about and how you're going to 
<clears throat> how you're going to approach it. Like you said earlier, um, we tend to focus on strictly a review and analysis, but a lot of the riff is based on, you know, nostalgia and your memories connected to the music. How do you decide how you're going to approach whatever album or song that you're writing about? Like me personally as a writer when I'm writing or? Yes, I'm you writing. personally. <clears throat> um, well, I wish I had like a super, you know, actionable plan here, but basically I listen to a record and I start writing notes down and then um, pretty soon I have kind of an outline. Um, if I have a story attached to a specific record or song, that kind of makes it easy because I can sort of, you know, braid the two together. Um, if I'm reviewing a newer record or new to me, then I'm kind of just going in cold. Um, but I basically start, um, so at my day job, I still have a teletype printer next to my desk. I think I've told this story before, but um, it spits out teletype messages all day long. Um, and I take those and on the back start scribbling out. That's what I use to scribble out outlines. Um, so I have, I have kind of a list of ones that I want to review um, for re as, when, as far as choosing a specific record. Um, people have sent me submissions like, hey, you should totally do this one. Um, but once I get in, I just sort of, and a lot, and honestly, a lot of the time, I think I know which way I want to go. And then it goes a completely different way. So, um, I just kind of let it see where it takes me sometimes, I guess. Um, and make sure it's, you know, try to make it interesting and commute, you know, at least let people know something clear other than just a diary entry, but yeah. Oh, how would you how would you say you approach writing? And and I'm pretty sure we've talked about this before. But how would you say you approach writing in that way? Would you say it's different or, or it's similar? And I, I'm not completely familiar with your writing um, approach, but I'm familiar with the outcome. I feel like definitely for newer things, it's easier to just talk about what I just heard. And for everything, I usually try to listen to it at least three times. And the first time is just to listen to it for what it is. The second time I focus on lyrics and I usually read the lyrics while I'm listening. And then the third time it's um, trying to find whatever central theme or concept, things like that. But lately I've been trying to be more, I guess, casual with how I approach it as opposed to talking about you know, super technical things like what oh, the 32 second market transitions into this thing. And I've realized that's not um, engaging for some people because we all love music. So for people like us, yeah, I know exactly what you meant, but someone else that may be overwhelming for them to read something of that detail. So just speaking about how it made me feel versus a technical description of an instrument or a sound or, you know, something like panning, you know, something really specific like that, that most people outside of people like us wouldn't pay attention to. So I just try to make it engaging and interesting. And specifically for albums, I try not to talk about every single song, um, especially with things I discussed are usually rap albums and those can be upwards of 18, 20 songs. So focusing on finding something I can connect three or four songs through than having a good informative paragraph versus describing, you know, every single one of those songs and not saying anything noteworthy or just repeating myself. So yeah, my, approach, mom, yeah, just being more engaging with the piece and making it accessible for everyone while also sharing something that showcases any prior knowledge I may have about the artist or the genre. I think if I could just jump in really quick, I hundred percent. And I think what I try, I think if as a writer, if you can pull me in and I'm on the street, walking down the street with you or on, on campus with you, Josh, as you're hearing this record, then you've done, then that's great writing. You know, if, if you can pull somebody in and experience it, um, almost the same way you are, then then that's huge. Um, there is a space for that sort of technical writing that Paul's talked about. Um, I think that's a limited audience. I, there's people like probably on this panel that would eat it up. Like I am interested in what happens at 
the 32nd mark or whatever. But more importantly, I want to know not only about the record, but, you know, how the author has experienced it. And I try and do that um, in my own writing as well. That is one of the things that that I see on a larger scale, particularly in the in the largest music publications, the the, the two headed dragon of Pitchfork and Rolling Stone, is that they're very disconnected. So it, journalistically, you have you are pretty much required to exclude yourself as a writer from the experience of what you're writing about. And for me, what well, that's one of my biggest things is that as and we'll eventually talk about this. Robin brought this idea of it. The subjectivity of music does not allow you to exclude yourself from what you're listening to, um, which is basically the entire basis of music journalism itself is that the opinion of the writer matters so much in what you're writing that you cannot exclude yourself from it. Um, I could talk about my approach, but it's a little, it's a little different. M most people have seen my writing for my major album reviews it's come literally an hour after like it releases and i sort of just have a rise i go and listen type thing i have an english background um from college so i can just kind of pump out a little essay and pretty quickly and i did that with travis scott's utopia and um occasionally mars album i pretty much do that for all the major releases i'll do it with the drake album that's coming out soon and I know Paul and Mark don't really take that approach. They'll they'll let it marinate for a few days. But for me, I know instantly whether or not I'd like something and I can make a pretty a um pretty good like judgment of what music is pretty quickly. I don't know if that makes sense or and like my process probably doesn't make sense like the normal person, but I I got it down pat, honestly. Um I know uh well honestly our time I don't think they're going to stop us, but I'll, I'll let um, Cassie and Robin ask Kevin um, your questions so you, can, you guys can go ahead. Yeah, um, just especially as we've been talking about kind of the differences between MMA and the riff, like just in a uh, time of release sense, just how new releases are incorporated into your kind of listening. Like, do you have a system for staying up to date? Is that something that you're kind of focused on or is it a little bit... Is it not? Because I know for me, that's kind of a big part of my sort of day to day and both as a listener and as a writer is keeping up to date with those new releases. Um, so just wondering how you approach that and if you even have any sort of like system or anything. Um, we don't have a system per se. Uh, if anyone wants to write about uh, new releases or records, uh, I'm happy to accept it. We don't have a block, you know, there's no... Um, you know, we don't only write about, you know, pre-2000 or, you know, just the 90s. It just sort of happens that that's kind of how it's currently playing out. But um, there's a, a guy named Stanley that go, has his writer name of If Ever You're Listening that used to write a ton of new music discovery stuff um, fairly regularly. Um, he sort of, you know, he, he was also, uh, I think he was in grad school, so it sort of dropped off, but, and he's come back a little bit, but um, I guess the short answer is there's no restriction. If somebody wants to submit something about modern releases or, you know, brand new ones, um, bring them. I'm happy. I'm happy to have them. Yeah. Okay. Um, to, to go a little bit deeper into your question. Oh, sorry, Robert. I didn't mean to, I didn't mean to get you off. I, I, let me, uh, Okay. okay. Um, to answer a little bit more about your question, uh, you'll see this as you um, sort of write for a more like broader publications, like particularly like larger ones. That we're pretty lax in the way that we we sort of assign things. Per se, we don't assign things at all. But right. sometimes uh, for other other publications, you'll get a spreadsheet of all the new releases and. Sometimes you end up with a PR contact here and there, and you might get an advanced copy to an album. And that's sort of how you, you stay ahead of the curve um, as you make those connections. Making those connections is the hardest part, and most of the time, especially like a younger, younger, um, like a younger like journalist or something, that will be very open to getting in contact with you and sort of putting you 
in connection with other people because um, that's just the hardest part about being a journalist is staying in contact and getting connected to the people you need to get to to stay ahead of the curve because that's one of the tenets of journalism is timeliness. And that's sort of how a lot of our our most popular pieces became so popular is that they were so timely. Like my Utopia uh, review came out without the hour and that was probably the first hit on Google for like a night. And that that alone will put you that'll catapult you and that'll get you more eyes on your stuff. And and one of the other tenants that I'm not I'm not gonna go on a lecture here, but one of the other tenants is relevancy. And that's why Mark Space, the most popular one of the publication, is so popular because it's so relevant. Everyone's very interested in what Kendrick Lamar had to say into Biff Butterfly and the analysis of that album. Um, so yeah, it all basically boils down to connections, timeliness, relevancy, things of those natures. And as far as staying ahead of the curve, Robin, go ahead. Yeah, um, I don't really um, have a connection or something, but um, and also I don't have a real question. Um, not that I didn't prepare anything, but um, <laughs> maybe I didn't prepare anything. But my question is basically, um, we just talked about writing and what writing means. You know, um, Kevin, I think it was you who said that um, it's a story and it's always something personal and you make yourself you're attached to this piece of writing and let's say um, it's not taken into the publication, then this could hurt people or something. But um, I think that's opposed to what I, what I believe because there's these um, um, actually quite interesting psychoanalytical um, um, thought process from Lacan, which who says that um, a letter, it doesn't matter if it arrives at its, where it's, at its destination, um, it will always arrive at the destination just by, you know, you are the destination, basically, you know, your own great other is the destination. And that's my, my question is basically um, coming back from this, how can weird people like me actually um, find a place in the internet or in publications? Because I sometimes think, um, yeah, I can't, I can't pop or I can't submit it, submit this piece because it's, no one will understand it. Um, Josh will tell me that it's too um, weird. And um, I'm, I also have a different approach, you know, I don't rate things and so on. And my question is, how can people like me, um, yeah, that are, I don't know, a bit out of place and, and, and stuck in academia, um, how can we find a place in music publications because music is a topic that I really enjoy and um, it's important for me, but I'm, yeah, I kind of feel stuck and, and maybe you can help me out of it. <laughs> well, first of all, I think one of the advantages of writing online or, you know, even in 2023 is that there's an audience for everything. Um, it might be an issue of you trying to find them or, you know, them finding you, but eventually they will. Um, I mean, you don't have to look, I don't have to tell anyone here, like you don't have to go very far to find, you know, a different writing style or an obscure topic that has a huge following or, you know, people that are really into it. Uh, my advice to you um, specifically for medium is if you're not having any luck submitting to publications, um, just self publish for a little while and connect with other people um, who are writing similar stories or whose work you just enjoy. Um, and that will sort of build, um, you know, a little growth organically and you'll gain a little bit of momentum and slowly and slowly it'll go faster and doors will open. I, I, I guess I would say if, if what you're writing is something you really believe in, keep doing it. Um, and, you know, also don't be afraid to ask people for feedback. Um, you know, maybe, if, if it's a subject, I'm sure it's fine and, and it'll find a home and people that want to read it. Um, but I, I guess I would just say, you know, keep going. I know that sounds kind of cliche, but it's true. Um, you know, it's not easy to write online and it's not easy to write, period. Um, there's a lot, it's a lot of uphill battles, but just keep going. Most of it's a battle of attrition. Um, you'll find your audience, man. Thanks, but um it's it's not just uh, for me it's not just about audience basically it's 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 more about um as you said you're connected to your writing and 
this means not only that you're one and uh, that you are basically attackable or something no it also means at the same time um that this is um yeah how to how to say it um yeah it's it's not just important for you or at least for me it's also something um i want to do and that's not my problem my problem is not the audience my, my, my problem is that um I always think like um, they don't want to read this. You know, I, I I don't see the reader in my stories. You know, I'm always thinking like, oh man, no nobody's is, is going to read this and, and and liking it because it's too crazy, it's too 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 complex or too yeah not interesting enough. And that's just maybe it's just my my perspective on myself. It doesn't matter really much, but yeah. Well, I think, I mean, it matters. It's it's your work and it's important to you. Um, I think, you know, the more you keep writing, you'll get data points. Like readers will tell you if it resonates or not, you know. Um, I don't really like reading my stats because it's kind of an ego blow. But, you know, if you have something that really lands with readers, you'll know like fast. Um, and that'll tell you maybe I should go in this direction or that, you know, this other, you know, take this other path. So um, I would just say, keep, keep at it and see, you know, what they're telling you, what feedback you're getting. Yeah, that, that's a really good point. Um, so one of the things I always tell myself is to never betray your style. Um, every writer has a particularly unique voice. And if you betray that style, you're just becoming one of everyone else. And that's not who we are as writers is we are, we have our own new, unique voice and there's no sense in betraying, betraying that, that voice we have to sort of homogenize ourselves. If that makes sense, you shouldn't homogenize yourself for the, for the sake of the readers. Cause if the readers like what they're reading, they'll, they'll continue to read. hundred percent. Kevin, this, this is where I ask you if you have any questions for us in particular. I know we've bombarded you with questions. No, that's all right. See if you had any questions for um, us. No, I, I don't. I've been kind of trying to catch up on everybody's stuff and reading, so I knew what was going on, but um, I don't really have any yet. So um, I do see we have some uh, questions in the both in the chat and maybe the Q&A. Maybe we can hit some of those. Yes. Uh, the first question I see is from Francis Bradford, who asks, or who says, I've been leading off some articles with some connected song lyrics and how they relate to the article. Do the, do the panelists think that's an effective technique, leading off, leading off some articles with connected song lyrics? Uh, I, I think it can be. Um, I think you have to be careful just to use, like, maybe one verse or, you know, maybe a sentence or something that really resonated or, you know, one um, one or two, a couplet. Um, what I would say is don't put the entire song up there because not only that, not only is it not yours, but now we're talking about fair use issues. Um, but if you can use like a verse, um, Paul, I think you talked about lyric sheets earlier. Um, like I read them because I can't hear that well anymore. So that's super important. But if I can hear that um, and you can use that, um, you know, that verse or those verses as sort of a through line um, through your piece, then definitely. Um, just to, I would, my only carve out there would be say, maybe just use one verse or maybe even one or two lines as opposed to the entire song. Yeah, I would agree. So uh, opening article, you should always aim to hook your readers in. Lyrics are pretty effective in doing that sometimes depending on what they are. Uh, uh, I think the sort of go-to for most like album reviews and things of that nature are sort of prefacing the work. Uh, you'll give a little bit about the artist's background, um, their former works, and sort of what the lead up to the current album you're listening to is. That's sort of like the go-to, not necessarily required by any means, but that's just sort of the go-to like you can open up with lyrics especially if it like pops at you like if that's the first thing you think of when you listen to an album that's a really good way to start it 
or if it encapsulates an artist um, in some way is a really would really good go really good way to go about it. Sorry. Um, one of them. I, see, no, I guess kind of question here. Go ahead. Oh, sorry. I was just scrolling through the Q and A. Uh, Sarah Paris asked. What's the first thing that draws you into a song? Beats, lyrics, etc. And do you embrace a plethora of genres? Um, and I, real quick, I would say for me, uh, the beat and the sound is always uh, first for me anymore. Um, especially because, like I said, my hearing is trash and I can't always hear the words clearly. But if it's got a good beat or a good rhythm, I'm I'm all in. Like we can talk about lyrics later. So, um, and genres. Um, you know, I used to be, you know, I'm kind of a reformed gatekeeper um, and I was just pretty snotty at that. But anymore, I'll, I'll listen to anything. Honestly, if it if it moves me or makes me move, I'm in. So um, I don't know if that's how you guys feel as well, but yeah. Yeah, for, for me, it's it's definitely your lyrics and and. Um, the genres I'm usually listening to are completely different than what I'm reviewing. So um, I'd, maybe this is some sort of subjectivity for me because um, uh, objectivity for me because I usually listen to something different and then um, what I'm reviewing is something I from the from the premise basically hate and then I can start to love it. You know, it's like inverted for me. Um, but that's just me, I kind of like already gave my answer in the chat to Sarah, but to kind of elaborate a little bit more, uh, for me, it's definitely like the beat and the instrumentals. I'm a huge, I'm huge on like production. So if it doesn't hook me in within like maybe the first 10, 15 seconds, I'm going to get bored. I'm sorry, honestly. Um, I guess in genres, I am really picky what I, what I listen to. I mainly just stick to like what I'm comfortable with. I do try to expand every now and again, but I just, I like listening to what I, I'm comfortable with, so I just stick with that pretty much. Cassidy, you can answer that one too, um, if you want, because I already yeah, gave I, a I, Yeah, I mean, I make a pretty uh, concerted effort to kind of expand my genre listening. I feel like at a certain point I was in a pretty deep hole of like really into like 60s, 70s and like not really expanding any farther from that and I could see that it was kind of whenever I would try and write about music it would then like kind of impact it so I just I really try and like at least once a day try and listen to something that wouldn't normally be in my daily rotation just to kind of get that exposure and then potentially like more research on it will follow and then that kind of context always helps so I feel like yeah it's it's kind of I've, I've expanded from like the kind of classic rock and kind of indie-esque into a lot more of like kind of niche uh, grunge and like kind of shoegaze, that sort of thing. Just kind of anything that I don't think I would normally put on, I try and at least turn to um, once a day. Just, I feel like it's very helpful just to kind of hear what's going on in other genres. And it kind of then provides a little bit more context for the things that I do enjoy. And then it kind of, it's always good, I think in my opinion to expand uh, their music taste as much as possible. So, yeah, that's usually my approach. I don't see any other questions. I don't, um, were there any more in the chat or? I don't see any. Um, is there um, is there anything we didn't cover that you guys wanted to do before we? I know we ran over already, which is a good problem to have. But um, did we miss anything? Is there anything uh, for those of you listening? Is there anything you wanted to ask, or that maybe we missed? Um, Francis asked, "Is anyone else publishing faith faith based music articles?" Uh, if I'm honest, Francis, I think you're the only one I know that has done that. I'm sure there's some on Medium somewhere. Uh, I just haven't come across any yet. So 
Um, I know you just stood up a music publication as well. Um, maybe that's maybe that's a great lane for you. I'm not sure, um, but I haven't seen any yet. Anything else? Anyone else? Um, did we lose Josh, or am I just not seeing him? Um, they he said he got removed somehow. I don't know what happened. I still see everyone yeah, except right, yeah. him. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I, I all right. Um, well, the only. Uh, the only uh, he had a couple other questions. We might as well, if you guys want to do a round robin. The first one, um, uh, he he wanted me to have at least uh, top of mind in case it came up was uh, album of the year for you guys so far. If we want to just go around. Um, oh, Josh, you're back. Okay. Yeah, I got super booted. That was crazy. <laughs> um. Um. Uh, sorry, guys. Uh, uh, my album of the year is Kalila's Raven. It's um, swooning, yet dark, romantic, and eclectic. Uh, that sort of dance revival has been very fun to listen to over the past two or three years. And she is a shining example for 2023. Uh, I'm going to jump in and just say, when we all say our favorite albums of the year, just put them in the chat just so everyone can like see the artist and name um, exactly in case they're interested. Um, yeah, but I'm not going to say mine yet. Um, I guess I'll take a stab at it. For me, um, it's got to be Life is But a Dream by Avenged Sevenfold. Uh, I'm a huge fan of these guys. Been listening to these guys since I was like maybe 10, 11 years old. Um, very experimental in terms of heavy metal music, especially if you listen to Event Sevenfold. It's not as formulaic as their other albums, which I appreciate a lot. Um, lyrically, it's very existential. I think it's inspired by Albert Camus or Camus. I'm probably saying that wrong. So if you're familiar with his works of like absurdism, you're probably going to catch some nuances of that as well. Um, I have a feeling it might get dethroned, but for that's where it stands. That's my favorite album of the year, for sure. Um, I think mine is, um, well, I, I guess I'm going to have to pick one. Um, you know, every year I worry that this is going to be a year where there's not that much stuff out. And this year there was just an avalanche of great stuff. Um, I think uh, Continuous Guest by the New Pornographers is probably my favorite so far. Um, it's just fantastic. It's just a nice, it's well put together. Um, it's sonically interesting. Uh, Nico Case uh, is one of the singers. Um, it's just a great power pop record. Um, it was written during the pandemic, but it doesn't have pandemic record vibes. Um, it's just, um, it's a fantastic, it's just a fantastic release. So, um, and then, yeah, if I had to narrow it down, that would be my pick today. So. Um, for me, uh Desire I Want to Turn Into by Caroline Polachek has definitely been my favorite. Um, she kind of takes what she did on Pang and just completely elevates it and explores even more different genres between songs and even within songs. So I think it's a great listen. Um, I'll go next. Um, oh, no, go ahead, Robin. Go ahead. I'll go last. OK, 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 OK. Um, yeah, for me, it's kind of um, it's hard because if you ask my album of the year, then it's definitely the Oppenheimer soundtrack from Gurrenson. But um, if you ask the albums that that go into the modern music analyzed more kind of, I mean, it's also a bit off pick, but um, I would go with um, 12 from Sakamoto, which was um, early the year and he died. Um, yeah. And maybe if the Smile releases an album this year, I mean, the track Bending Hectic, the singer is always already great. So I believe maybe this will also be a good pick. I don't know. <laughs> I would say mine is in terms of just favorite without, you know, rambling on about technical stuff. Um, the Great Escape by Larry June and the Alchemist. 
Um, a lot of people have been discussing, oh, what's the summer album of the year? And for me, that one really feels like a summer album in terms of the lightness of the production. It sounds relaxing, but it's also motivational. And I think it just is one of those projects you can really play all the way through and you still get a visual concept out of it, like the summer, a sunny day, the beach, things like that. But that's not, you know, drilled into you through the lyricism because the lyricism is just, you know, motivational stuff and talking about being out in the sun. So, um, yeah, I think it's the first album for me that truly felt like a summer album. And I probably won't be listening to it, you know, when the fall and winter comes, because it'll feel out of place. But I've definitely listened to it like every day since it came out, which I think was like March this year. So, yeah. And I do have an honorable mention that I have to put out there because otherwise it'll get, it'll get lost in the ether. Um, Jordan Ward's uh, Forward. I think he has still has less than a million monthly follow or monthly listeners or whatever. That is one one A and one B for me. Those two albums, Jordan Ward and Kalila. Like as a twenty something, like what Jordan Ward had to say on Forward is was very timely for me. Like he's a little bit older than I am. He's probably closer to thirty than twenty five. But it was just so timely for me as a twenty something to hear things about hope and moving away and things of that nature. So uh, I really appreciate him and, and, and Khalil and all, all your guys' choices are really good. Um, we've all written about them. So um, great job, guys. I think I think that's – let me check just to make sure. I think that's everything, um, unless the audience has any other questions um, or if anyone has anything else they would like to throw out there, go ahead. Um but I'll go ahead and say I, I appreciate everyone for gathering with me here today uh, for the Modern Music Analysis panel with uh, Kevin Alexander of The Riff, um, Paul, Mark, Robin, Cassidy. Thank you for joining me. Um, and you guys have a wonderful day, unless you have anything else to add. Uh, no, just thank you for having me and including me on the panel. And uh, this has been a blast. And thanks for everyone with your questions in the audience. Uh, yeah, this has been great. We'll see you out on Medium, I guess, huh? All right, guys. I'll, I'll end it here. I think we're over our time anyway. That's probably why I got booted. But um, mm. thank you for joining me, guys. Thanks for joining, everyone. Thank you for the questions. Thanks, everyone.